Hi folks, this is the first time I've ever done a, uh, a Zoom meeting of this type, so bear with me if, uh, if things kind of happen. I can tell you one thing that's going to happen for sure. I've got a, uh, a fuzzy black assistant who is currently crouched in front of the camera, who I'm sure will interject himself at some point. Um, you can see his ears there. Um, this talk right here is about uh, designing essentially heraldic arms. Um, what exactly are heraldic arms? Well, um, historically, um, heraldic arms were used as a way of identification. Therefore, uh, you can think of your heraldic arms kind of like your heraldic signature or your heraldic persona. If you were a, uh, a soldier on the field, you can see. Angela, please come and get your cat. <laughs> if you're a soldier on, your, on the field, uh, your heraldic arms are used to identify yourself on the field because it's generally considered rude if when you're on the field, if, if your friends start throwing arrows at you, uh, you want to reserve that to um, just your enemies. So heraldry is designed in a way as to be identifiable over a very large range over a long distance. So one of the hallmarks of good heraldry is that you want to have really good ability to identify the various aspects. If you look behind me right here, have my arms and my wife's arms. You can see that everything on this is very bold and very identifiable over a long period, over a long distance away. And these are actually uh, done that way on purpose. If you get right down to it, a lot of medieval heraldry, a lot of the rules for medieval heraldry, actually you can still find them in place even in modern advertising. Um, so essentially what you've got when you're looking at your arms and you're looking at heraldry, what you're looking at is your heraldic identification. This is a way of identifying you personally so that you are not confused with the next person um, on the field or away from the field. Now, <clears throat> setting up and displaying arms is a completely different class. All right, I'm not going to worry too much about that. Right now, we're going to worry primarily about setting up and designing the arms that you're trying to put together. All right, well, when you're setting up arms, um, where is it that you start? Well, as, um, as Inigo Montoya said so well, when, you're, when your thing goes wrong, you start at the beginning. And in heraldry, the beginning is the field. Now, here we're looking at not just the field, but we're just looking at here, just looking at the background of the arms, right? Now, what are your options when you're looking at your arms? Well, Essentially, when you're looking at arms, your colors or your palette is divided up into two groups. You have colors and you have metals. When you're looking at this, when you're thinking about these, think about your standard Crayola crayon box. Your standard Crayola crayon box is a pretty good indication of a heraldic colors. Um, your color options are, you have black, which is defined as sable. You have vert, which or green, which is defined as vert. You have blue, which is defined as azure. This one's a little weird. This one you have red, which is ghouls. And then you have purple, which is for pure, All right? When you're putting these things together, what you wanna do is when you're putting your colors together, don't think terribly fancy. You wanna think about your Crayola crayon type of colors. So if you want red, 
make it red, not pink. If you want blue, make it blue, not navy blue, not sky blue. You want blue, all right? So these are your colors. And then next to them, you have your metals, all right? Metals are defined as yellow, which is defined as ore, gold, and then white, which is defined as argent or silver. I'm going to get, excuse me, I'm going to give you a very fundamental uh, explanation to the various rules of heraldry, right? Um, there are some variations that sometimes occur, but I'm not going to go into those. I'm going to make this really, really, really fundamental here. So you have colors and you have the metals, all right? And the rules of contrast are very, very, very specific, all right? You want to mix, you want to put metals on top of colors or colors on top of metals. The rules are very explicit. You cannot put a metal, or sorry, a color on top of another color. You cannot put a metal on top of another metal, all right? And this is what we're talking about. Um, when we are mixing, when we're starting to put things together and mix things up, all right? If you think about modern day, the same contrasting rules still apply in modern day. Stop sign. A stop sign is a red field with white lettering on it, all right? If you look at a, a yield sign, all right? A yield sign is a yellow sign with black lettering on it. If you look at your road signs, your road identification signs on the interstate, those are either going to be green or blue fields with white lettering on it. In fact, if you look at a shell oil sign, a shell oil sign is the yellow shell with the red lettering on it. So a lot of the rules of heraldry, which were designed in the relatively early Middle Ages, still apply to modern day, uh, modern day advertising. All right, so our fundamental palette are our colors and our metals, all right? Now, these are, you can see right here, I've got these all on a standard um, shield shape. And that's usually what you begin with when you're looking at this is your standard shield shape. Um, when you're doing your presentation, you might present it as a, as a banner like this. But when you're designing it, you're going to use the shield. So what we're looking at here, these are simple fields, right? And in a simple field, you simply have one color and you have just the entire field is one color and then you're gonna build on top of this. Now, um, you can also have what are called hybrid fields. And hybrid fields are, excuse me a minute here, I've got them in the wrong place here. Uh, are what we call furs. Now these are supposed to represent um, various aspects of furs that were coming. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention something earlier. Um, this talk is based on a talk that I've done at RUM a number of times. Um, I do have the handout for this available. Uh, I can email it to you. Um, it's also available in the, um, the SCA Herald's website. Uh, and you see actually parts of this are available on the New Kingdom Persuivance Handbook. So this is, um, this is pretty well established. If you're interested in having the handout though, please let me know and I can, uh, I can email it to you and that shouldn't be a problem. All right, um, fields represent, these hybrid fields, these furs represent uh, essentially, well, furs. Um, they represented the types of furs that were commonly worn during the Middle Ages. So what we have here is we have ermine, which is essentially a white field with these black ermine spots on it. Then there is ermine noir, which is a yellow field with black ermine spots on it. Then counter ermine, if this is ermine, counter ermine, if this is ermine, white with black spots, counter ermine is black with white spots. Note, these go completely across. I've, I've got these drawn really big so that they're a little bit more visible, but these would cover the entire field. These would generally be a lot smaller. Down here, we have what is called teen, which is the opposite of ermine noir. So here I have 
yellow, I had black spots on a yellow field, or I had yellow spots on a black field. And then there is what's called ver, which is kind of an odd fur. It represents a series of squirrel skins sewn together. And so here we have these diamond, these kind of these odd shaped um, arrowhead pieces inverted one relative to another. And these are usually going to be blue and white. And again, these extend over the entire field. Now, this represents a different type of field. Now, this, these, are, these hybrid fields are still considered one uniform field, kind of the ermine spots. And by the way, there's a variety of different types of ermine spots that are available. This is a very traditional type. There are just sheets and sheets of, of different types of ermine spots, which are possible. So there's any variety of these that can actually be applied. Um, regardless, you wanna make sure that the ermine spots contrast appropriately with the field. If they don't, you're not gonna, you're gonna have problems. Because essentially these ermine spots are kind of images that are being superimposed onto the field. We'll talk about that in a few minutes also. All right. So right now we have a plain field which is just a single, um, what we call tincture, basically either a color or a metal on a single field. Then you have the, the uh, furs, which are representative of a, uh, of a hybrid field. Well, we can also have what are called varied fields. And varied fields are fields that are split in some form or other, all right? You can have them split down, up and down. This would be called propel, split horizontally. This is profess. This is diagonal from upper left to lower right. This would be bend or per bend. The opposite of that would be per bend sinister. Then you can have it split in four, which would be quartered. You can have it split in four diagonal. This would be per saltier. Then we have this little diamond shaped piece right here, which is per, per chevron. Here the diamond is pointing down, per chevron inverted. And here we have a complex one called a gyrony. And gyrony, basically you can think of a gyrony as a combination of quartering and per salt here. So you've got one, two, three, four. Now, the rules of contrast do not necessarily apply to a, um, a parted field. And the reason for that is that the rules of contrast state that you cannot have a metal on a metal or a color on a color. These are not considered, so for example, right here, I have green and red, but this and this are not on top of each other. They are next to each other. Here and here, these are not on top of each other. They're next to each other. So these fields, these types of divisions are completely allowable. You can have metal, metal next to a color. That's perfectly fine too. You can have metal next to, a, next to another metal. That's perfectly fine too. So all of these types of divisions are completely allowable in these color combinations. But you want to be aware that some color combinations are a little bit tough. For example, here I've got sable, and here I've got purpure. And you can see that the black and the purple are kind of hard to distinguish from each other. Um, similarly, sometimes green and blue, ver and azure, tend to be a little bit hard to distinguish from each other. Now, having said that, the nice thing about these uniform these uniform color fields or these uniform metal fields is that the field itself becomes just one unit. So when you're putting stuff on top of it, it simplifies how you're going to put stuff on top of it. Um, hopefully I'm not boring everybody to death on this. The problem that you've got with being a herald is that when you're a herald, it almost requires that you're boring. So I will try to, to limit my boringness as much as I can, but understand it's an inherent problem with, with heralds when we talk. Okay.
So here I have parted fields where I have simple divisions. I can also have what are called varied fields. And in varied fields, I have the same fundamental divisions that we saw previously, except that now the divisions can be multiplied. So for example, I had a FES, I'm sorry, I had a FES here. If I add a whole bunch of FESs, I have Bari. I had a Bend and Bend Sinister. I add a whole bunch of them. I have Bendy and Bendy Sinister. Here I have Paley all going up and down. Now, if I take Barry, if I take Barry and Paley and I combine them, I generate Checky. If I take Bendy and Bendy Sinister, Lozenge. And if I take Chevron and add a bunch of Chevrons, I now have Chevroni. Um, again, you can have metal with color. You can have color with color. You can have metal with metal. And it works out pretty well with these types of fields. Now, you got to be careful. These fields right here, if you have a metal and a color together, this kind of a field right here is generally considered to be neutral. This field right here, and you'll understand what I mean by neutral in a minute when I start talking about putting stuff on top of these fields. This field right here with two metals would be considered a metal field. This field right here with two colors would be considered a colored field. So when I'm putting stuff on top of this, I'm limited to putting colors or metals on top of this one and colors on top of this one. So these are the kind of things you have to consider when you're putting this, when you're putting your, your heraldry together. All right. Um, one of the things I don't have drawn up properly here is that along with these divisions, I've got these line divisions very straight, right? The line divisions can also be um, more complex. Fortunately, I don't have a picture of that, but if you, I'm not sure how well you can see this, but there's a variety of different divisions that you can add to these so that the, the lines themselves can be different shapes. You can have embattled, you can have um, kind of uh, dovetailed, you can have um, wavy, you can have what's called nebulae. So there's a variety of options when you're actually doing the divisions themselves, right? And that, that becomes really interesting because it gives you a lot of, of design possibilities when you're trying to put this stuff together. All right. The, at this point, we've got a number of different types of fields that are possible when you're putting together your arms, right? So at this point, what you're going to be doing is that you wanna start putting things onto the field. And this is where the rules of contrast start to become really, really important, right? Um, the first thing you wanna look at, or the first type of a, of a, of a field that I wanna talk about really quick is what's called a center. Block the, block the image right here. In a semi, you have is a series of, of pictures that you're simply putting onto the field, right? These are usually relatively small. If you think about the American flag, in the upper corner, you have the blue field with the white stars. Well, technically that's 
a semi of stars as opposed to the blue, the white and red horizontal stripes, which are essentially a berry. So what you've got there is the American flag is technically a berry field with a blue canton on it, blue, a small blue field inserted, and I'll talk about those in a minute, with a, a series of stars. Um, so this is the first example of how you start putting things onto the field. As you put things onto the field, you wanna make sure that the contrasting rules are being applied at this point, all right? The straightforward contrasting rules state that you can put a metal on top of a color, you can put a color on top of metal. So here, for example, I have a white field and I put a semi of black squares onto the white field, right? So I have sable semi on an argent field. That's perfectly allowable. And again, there are a variety of different types of fields that you can apply, a variety of different semis. Um, you can use drops. Technically speaking, the ermine, the ermine field that I showed you, These fields right here are technically semis, where you have a field and then you have a semi of the ermine spots on them. So technically speaking, an ermine fur, one of these ermine fields is technically nothing more than a semi with a very specific name. Um, and there are some others that have similar, similar rules. If you've got any, uh, any book on heraldry, we'll have a, a number of these that are, that are listed. Okay. My, my helper is back. Uh, I'm sure that he will get in the way in a moment. Uh, at this point, what you wanna do is you wanna start putting things onto the field, all right? The field is the background. The things that you're putting onto the field are called charges, all right? And charges are things that are being superimposed onto the background, being placed on top of the background. When you're building your arms, you start with the you start with the with the foundation, with the field, with the background, and then you build everything onto it, as if you are laying things onto the field. So the first thing we're going to look at is a specific type of charge, and these charges these are big charges at this point. These are called ordinaries. Um, There are, um, these are big, ordinaries are big geometric designs, all right? And I've got the nine common ones. I think there's one or two less common ones that you might run into as well. All of these, when you are applying them to the field, the rules of contrast are strictly in effect at this point because these are images which are being laid onto the field itself. So here I have a fess, there's a bend sinister and a bend. These are diagonal bends. I have what's called a pawl, which is kind of a Y. You can have both the Y facing down and you can have the Y facing up. Either one of those is allowable. This would be a pawl. You can also have what's called a pawl inverted where you have it the other way. I have a horizontal bar. This is a pail. I can have a chevron or a chevron inverted. Again, you'll notice that a lot of these are geometric designs that are based on the field divisions, which we saw on the fields themselves. So if I take my persalt here and I make a big X with it, I have what is called a saltier. And then down here, my quartered field becomes a cross. Note, in all of these, you can use those complex field divisions, which I mentioned previously. So these can be, you can have these straight, you can have these embattled, you can have these wavy, you can have these what's called rayonetti. There's a variety of different ways you can have them with flames. There's a variety of different um, ways that these can actually be represented. Um, and again, what you're looking at here 
is that these are geometric images that are being placed on top of the field, right? These can be placed alone or they can be placed in combination with other, with other charges. And I'll talk about that in a moment too. So these are the larger, these are called ordinaries. Then you have what's called the subordinaries. Subordinaries are slightly smaller units. So you have this piece up here, which is in the top portion, which is called a chief. You can also have one in the bottom, which is called a base. Um, this is an escutcheon, which is basically a little shield superimposed on the big shield. You can have what's called a treasure, which is a shield shaped, um, it, we call this voided in the middle, um, shield shaped frame right here. And you can have, but if you expand this all the way to the outside, you have a border. This right here runs along the entire outside. You have what's called a pile, which is this big V coming down. This is kind of like a chevron, which extends all the way through. This is a canton, which is like we see in the American flag. Um, this is a big canton is the essence. It's called a quarter. So here, take the big quarter piece from this part of the field, and we're essentially just taking one piece of this, and that generates our subordinary here. So here we have quarter. Here's a gyron, which is one piece of a gyrony. And we have a lozenge, which is kind of like this diamond shape right here. And then here is a fret, which is exactly like we see in the purple fret for our, uh, for our uh, awards. There's actually another one called a flaunch, which is a piece that's kind of like this. I couldn't fit that on this, on this shield. The sheet. All of these obey the rules of contrast. So in all of these, you have to have a color on a metal or a metal on a color in order to have the proper contrast for what you're putting together here. All right. Um, okay. So these are the big geometric images. And if you look at my wife's and my See that she's got a bend over here. I've got what is in essence a chevron over here. Um, and then we have other things that are on this. Now, the other things that are on these are pictorial charges. Now, pictorial charges can essentially be any image you want to represent on the arm. All right. So, for example, my wife has on this bend, she has ram's heads, and then she has these crescents on the bend. Bends themselves, these ordinaries can also be charged. So you can have essentially a picture on top of a picture, but no. In my wife's case, you have the green field, then you have the white bend, then you have the black, uh, crescents. So I have clear contrast between the crescents and the bend, and then I have clear contrast between the bend and the field. Similarly, the ram's heads are white on the green field. So again, I have clear contrast between the ram's heads and the field itself. On my arms, this right here is it's is drawn as a chevron, but the reality is it's actually a different charge called a point, all right? So I have the yellow or gold point on my black field, and I have what is called a roundel, which is just a, a fancy heraldic name for a circle, and then in my roundel, I have a hawk, right? So the, um, I have, we have both ordinaries, have yeah, technically a point is a sub is one of the subordinaries that I don't have listed. Um, it's a it's a special kind of base. So I have some subordinaries, um, and then I have some pictorial charges. Now, 
There are literally thousands of pictorial charges that you can use, all right? And the pictorial charges are where you can really start to personalize your arms. You can really start doing some really funky stuff with them if you want. Uh, pictorial charges can be animals. You can have tigers, you can have lions, you can have dragons, you can have horses, you can have bears. They can be things, you can have swords, you can have hammers, you can have axes, you can have um, castles, you can have uh, all kinds of different images are possible. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of charges that are available. If you go to find any book on heraldry, they will have lists of charges and in not, not only can you have the charges, but actually the charges can be placed in specific positions, which are called attitudes. I don't have anywhere near enough time to go through all of the possible attitudes and all of the possible positions for the various charges. Um, this is something that you want to look at um, when you're putting this stuff together. Um, there are a couple of very convenient and very useful sources for charges. Um, hoping that this is going to come out correctly because otherwise I'm going to have to write this backwards. What is called the hoping that came through, um, hoping you can. Um, that's the Penzik Art Project. Um, you can actually go online and you can look this up. Um, the other one is, what? called the Pictorial Dictionary of Heraldry, or or the Pic Dick. Um, both of these have a variety of images of the various types of charges that are available and that are accepted. Um, I find that the Penzik Art project, Penzik Traceable Art Project, is particularly useful um, because it was a essentially a database of all of the images that you can get that were submitted at Penzik over a couple of years, and that was really, 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 really useful. Um, the Pictorial Dictionary, the Pen. Um, also called uh, OE, um, has a lot of the accepted charges that you can find. The nice thing about that one is that they're listed alphabetically and they're listed by um, charge types, which makes it very useful um, to actually utilize it. Um, if this came out back, I apologize. Um, again, if you email me, I'll send you the links directly because, um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to put this thing here. All right. At this point, what we've got is we have all of the pieces of your heraldry. All right. And at this point, what you want to start doing is you want to start putting them together. Now, got to be careful at this point because you can't just go and start throwing things onto the field. You've got to remember that the rules of contrast must be obeyed at all times. And there are certain other artistic rules 
which even though they don't apply all of the time, are good fundamental and what I want to do right now is I want to define what I call basic parallel. Basic heraldry, right? Hopefully you can, hopefully you can see that. Um, basic heraldry. I use this mnemonic because it's a it's a nice way of kind of putting everything together. Um, B. B stands for balance. Balance kind of refers to how everything comes together. You want to have the pieces of the arms evenly distributed around the, uh, the shield. So for example, I wouldn't want all of the, the goat's heads over here, the ram's heads on one side and nothing over here on mine. I wouldn't want this all placed over on one side or lopsided. You want to, it, one of the things that was best described to me is that when you put your composition together, you want to be able to put all of the different pieces on it, and you want that device to roughly balance in the middle of the device, right? Um, you want to have a continuity or a, a good distribution of the arms, right? Um, one of the classic mistakes that people make, for example, what we call slot machine heraldry, where you have three different charges placed across a field that are not related to each other. This kind of a situation right here is something that you, that it's not allowed. It's relatively simple to fix. All I would do is as simple as that, and that balances out the, the composition a little bit. Um, Generally speaking, you're trying to distribute the pieces around the device as evenly as you can, because it makes for a simpler, it makes for a simpler composition when you're putting the whole thing together. Um, there are times when you can leave this thing off, you can, you can, um, you can shift things around, but you've got to be careful when you're doing this. Another thing you want to try to avoid is an instance that's called marshalling. Marshalling something like this. Now what marshalling represents is the combination of two households where one household has one coat of arms, the other one has a different device, and what you do is you simply glued them together to make a single unified device for the now unified households. Now in period 
They did this all the time. In the SCA, we don't allow marshalling because each individual is an individual in and of themselves. Your arms must be representative of you and they cannot be combinations of different arms. So you do not want to have two arms put together like this. Another common way of doing quartering, doing uh, marshalling was dividing You know, quarter-wise, like that. Um, both of these will immediately cause your, your submission to be returned because quartering is, is strictly right out, as they say. Okay, A. A stands for artistry. Artistry means that what you're doing when you're putting this stuff together is that you're not doing a painting. You're doing heraldry. Therefore, the representations of the various charges of the animals or of the, the images that you put on there should be heraldic. If you're putting a lion on, if you're putting a lion onto your field, you do not want to put Simba on your field. You want a heraldic lion. If you're putting a dragon on your field, you don't want to put Pete's dragon. You want a heraldic dragon. Remember that when you're putting your arms together, you are designing heraldry right here. If you want to go do art, go do it at an arts and sciences display. Here you're doing heraldry. So when you're doing your representation, you want to make sure that the design that you're putting down, that the charge you're putting down is heraldic. This is where both the picnic and the Penzik Traceable Art Project are really good because these give you the established heraldically correct charges. And when all you've got to do is just take those charges and put them onto your device and you automatically know that these are heraldically correct. And this makes, it simplifies your life considerably. S represents symmetry. Move this over a little bit. Symmetry means that this is kind of falls into the same rough category as balance, but there's a little bit more involved here. All right. To a modern, to a modern eye, we have a different feel for what would be considered, what would be considered aesthetic symmetry than they would have had in the Middle Ages. So, for example, to the modern eye, Something like this, where you have the three arrows, each pointing in different directions, would be perfectly fine. But to the medieval eye, this wouldn't look right. So in fact, what you would find instead is that you would find that it would be much more common to have 
everything pointed in the same direction. Everything would be pointed up, everything would be pointed down because this would be the kind of an aesthetic that they would be more familiar with. Now, having said that, there are exceptions to this that occur all the time. Um, one of the types of symmetry that was somewhat common in the Middle Ages is radial symmetry. This was not real common, but it did occur. It also occurred in a variety of different aspects when you were trying to put the, put the device together. All right. I integrity. When you're putting the device together, you want the device to hold together as a unified whole, right? So for example, on my wife's device, I wouldn't want to have the, um, the ram on one side and the, all the crescents on the other side with the bend in the middle. By doing it this way, I have an integrity between the overall composition, which actually looks pretty good. My device is pretty straightforward. Everything holds together. If I was to move this to any other part, if I was to move the central part to any other part, it would hold together. It wouldn't look, uh, it wouldn't look heraldically quite as good. In, in this area, this is again where, for example, marshalling comes in. The marshalling tends to give you different images on the same device. So when you have a Marshall device, that represents a device which isn't a single piece. It's a whole bunch of, it's basically a jigsaw puzzle of devices or of charges. So you want to try to avoid that at all costs. You want to have the overall arms have you want it to look like it's one piece. You want it to look like everything that is in the device is supposed to go together and is supposed to be in the place where it is, all right? The final thing, C, is Is contrast and clarity. Here again, we have the color on color and metal on metal rules. By putting everything together with different contrasting colors, it makes it easier to be able to see the device at a big distance. Remember, the purpose of the device is identification across a battlefield. Therefore, you want to be able to have all of the pieces clearly representable and clearly identifiable across the battlefield. Um, I have what I call Nighthawk's first rule of arms. And what Nighthawk's first rule of arms is, is to put, put your arms together, put it on a standard sized uh, shield about this big, and then Put it on your wall and walk about 20 feet away. You should be able to identify everything that is present in that device because that way you can tell that it's going to be identifiable from a long distance. Also, in the clarity and contrast, there's also don't have too much stuff going on. As you have more and more, as you start heaping more and more and more and more things onto a device, the device becomes more and more and more complex and becomes harder and harder and harder to identify all of the pieces within the device. 
So when you are trying to design your arms, you want to try and keep it as simple as you can so that it is identifiable over a very large, over a very long distance. All right, once you've got all that stuff together, then just start putting your arms together. Um, all of this stuff, when you, when you put it all together and it really looks nice, can be very, very striking. I've seen some really, really nice arms that have been uh, presented that follow these rules. Now, these are the fundamental rules for arms design. There are some, there are some exceptions which are allowed for specific countries and specific cases. But those are done on a case by case basis. And when you start making your device more atypical, when you start wandering farther and farther and farther from these heraldic rules, you're going to find it becomes more and more necessary to justify your, um, your deviation from standard convention. Um, I like to tell people if you're going to run with the squirrels, you better be ready to keep up because the heralds, as the farther you move off from standard convention, the more documentation that's going to be required and the faster these things will be returned to you. On the other hand, if you come up with something new or something unique and you can justify it, more power to you. For example, when I started these, these, and these animals in annula where you have a, a, a wolf and another wolf and another wolf in a circle around each other. They look like a CD cover. Um, those were, were not allowed, right? Or they were really, really, really rare. Well, they were able to justify those. And those have now become considerably more common in expression within the SCA. Um, when you're putting your arms together, the arms are based on how arms would have been designed in Western Europe during the Middle Ages. If you have a Middle Eastern or an African or an Oriental uh, persona, you're supposed to be representing the arms as you would have present, represented the arms if you were someone from that country trying to submit your arms in France or Germany or England or Spain or Italy. So even though the rules of arms in Japan or in China were very, or in Korea were very different than the rules were in Western Europe, hell, the rules in Eastern Europe, in Hungary or in, Pol or in, in Northern Europe, in Poland, were somewhat different than they were in Western Europe. When you are trying to represent your arms, make sure that you are trying to represent them as they would have been represented in Western Europe. Having said that, exceptions do occur. All right? Um, interesting point. People with Viking personas. Um, Vikings didn't have heraldry. All right? Heraldry extends from around the 10th century forward. The Vikings entire time period is pre 10th century. Same thing for Roman. Um, therefore, since heraldry didn't exist for these, any type of heraldry you want to apply is fine. Um, there are a variety of charges that are Viking of origin, right? There are some uh, Muslim or Moonlock charges, which are available that you can put on devices. Most Middle Easterners did not have heraldry in the same way that Western Europe had heraldry. So when you're putting together a Middle Eastern device, um, you can still use Middle Eastern charges, but you have to rip, you have to understand they didn't have heraldry, not in the way that we, not in the way that the Europeans did. Um, the Japanese their heraldry was very specific, right? Their rules were somewhat different. Their rules of contrast were very different from the European rules. Um, the, uh, the Japanese mons, which are just fascinating when you look at them, there were, there were books full of these Japanese mons. Um, 
the rules of contrast for Japanese mons and how they were displayed was very different than European. But when you're putting together a Japanese mon or a Korean or, um, or Burma or even Indian, you have to keep in mind that what you are doing is that you are submitting your arms for a Western European College of Arms. And that's how you want to do this. Um, the rules that I've given you are kind of generic. They're the common rules that apply to virtually all of the countries of Europe. As you start going into individual countries, you find that there are nuances in the heraldry which, which can actually help you identify the countries. Um, Spanish heraldry was slightly different than French heraldry, which was slightly different than English heraldry, which was slightly different than, than the various city-states in Italy or German. All of these had different rules and different, not really so much rules, as different, um, different styles that were applied to these different types of heraldry. And it becomes possible that you can look at the various um, countries that you're interested in and actually be able to apply some of these nuances to your arms to make them more specific for the country that you're trying to do. Um, you'll have to look those up because like I said, there is a, each one of the countries has, has different nuances that applied. And I'm not even talking about things like the difference between Japanese and European. I'm talking about the difference between, um, between French and Italian, right? Which can be, which can be very interesting. Um, a, a, there's a variety of books that are available that can that you can find this and you can discuss it. Um, I've seen these applied very effectively in, in some people's arms that make them look really cool. Um, next, um, people have asked me, well, what did the arms mean? Right, what does my heraldry mean? The answer to that is whatever you want. For the most part, Heraldry was a means of identification. So the primary thing you want to be able to do is to be able to be identified. Now, having said that, there's a specific type of heraldry which is called canting heraldry. And in canting heraldry, you have your heraldic representation actually representing your name. So for example, look at my arm. I have a hawk on a white field, on a black background, over a gold chevron. My name is Nighthawk. Therefore, I have a hawk in the circle of the moon over a mountain. So this is an example of canting arms. And canting arms occurred all the time in medieval heraldry and in Renaissance heraldry. Shakespeare had a spear with a with a pen nib on the tip. Um, the, the household, the Talbot household, has a dog called a Talbot on it. Um, the household of Fletcher might have arrows on it. So there's a variety of canting arms that are available that you can apply fairly easily. Um, you want to avoid um, certain things you want to try to avoid. Um, obviously, you want to avoid uh, offensive arms. If anybody puts a, uh, a swastika on your arms, you're absolutely going to be told to try that again. Um, there are other arms which are not, which are restricted. For example, the caduceus is restricted for people that are in the medical field, or at least they used to be restricted to people in the medical field. Um, Chains, gold chains, um, laurel wreaths are restricted to uh, the peers. If you've, got, uh, if you've got a coronet, you can't put coronets or you can't put indications of rank unless you have that rank. So you can't put a ducal coronet on your device unless you are a duke or a duchess. So uh, you need to know what the rules are with respect to what is and isn't allowed. And there, a decent, a decent uh, herald should be able to tell you um, what you need to know. 
Um, my position within the College of Heraldry is the Shield Herald. My job is helping people design arms and helping people design names. If you have questions of this type, um, where you're trying to um, find out information, please feel free to contact me, right? I'm on Facebook. You can contact me over Facebook. Um, there are a couple of other places you can go um, on Facebook. There is what is called the Mid-Realm Consulting Heralds List. Um, this is an open list and you can contact that directly and you can ask questions there. There's also a society-wide uh, Heralds List where you can, you can post your questions to that society-wide list and you can find information on those. These are all open lists, so you can get onto them, you can ask them your questions, and uh, I promise you that if you ask one question, you'll have five Heralds giving you 12 different opinions. Um, but you will find out lots of information that you need to know to design your arms. Um, the final point I want to, to make is don't be afraid to put something together. The worst that they can say is no, that's not gonna work, right? This is your heraldic representation. This represents you to the public. I would say, I would say conservatively, less than a quarter of the people in the SCA actually have registered arms, certainly less than half. And I think it's a great way of really getting into who you are in the SCA, or at least it's a good beginning. Um, as you get farther into the SCA, having registered arms is really cool. Um, putting together a big banner that you can fly at an event, that's really cool. Having arms that you can put on your, on your clothes or on, on furniture, that's really cool. Right? It adds a new level of realism to the game that we play. Um, yeah, sometimes it can take a little bit of effort, but that's why we are all here. We're all here to learn about the Middle Ages. And heraldry, I won't say that it's one of the easier things that you can learn, but it is certainly one of the most upfront things that you can learn because Virtually everyone, once you get an award of arms, virtually everyone is entitled to those arms. So go ahead and, um, and see what you can put together. Um, that pretty much completes what I've got planned for today. Um, if you have any questions that you'd like, I'd be happy to, to answer any questions you've got. Um, again, if you are interested in the handout, I would be more than happy to send you the handout. Um, the basic heraldry component right here, this is actually in the new Persuivance Handbook that's available um, on the Kingdom website under the heraldry link. You can actually find this part right here um, described in the Persuivance Handbook. Um, but I do have it more specific in the, in the handout that I've got. How you put this stuff together and how you display it, well, that's a completely different class. Uh, for another day. Um, I'm not sure how long I've been talking at this point. Um, so if you have any questions at this point, you can, you can send them to me. Otherwise, um, I'm pretty much finished with what I was going to say. After talking for an hour, give me a second to grab something to drink. Again, if, you're, if you want to contact me, you can contact me directly. Um, at some point over the next week or two, I may try to put together an online Heralda consultation um, session so that if you have questions, you can contact me directly. Um, any one of the senior Heralds, in fact, if you've got a local Herald, they should be able to help you with this to some extent. Your regional and senior Heralds should be able to help you fairly easily as far as putting the stuff together. Um, my job is specifically to help you. Um, so if you have any specific questions, again, please feel free to contact me. I would be more than happy to talk to you about it. Nighthawk? Yeah. 
Could you please put how to contact you on the whiteboard? Oh, well, I'm on Facebook. Um, so you can contact me on Facebook at This is on Facebook. And my email is It's rbaretto at pnw.edu is my email. You can contact me at either one. I'm always on Facebook. Uh, I'm on my email address most of the days of the week. Your hat is blocking the email. How's that? Hopefully it's coming across right side up because I'm looking at it and it's backwards. There is a question in the chat. Um, are there good guidelines for semi fields? Um, when you're putting together a semi, um, you just want the semi going across the entire field as much as you can. Um, You can do it kind of like this, where the pieces, as if you have, you can think of it like as a piece of cloth, or you have the entire sheet of cloth, and then you cut out the, uh, the semi out of the piece of cloth, or you cut off the pieces. Sometimes you can actually do it like, this, like the, the stars on the American flag, where you actually have a specific number of pieces within, or a specific number of images within the semi that can be applied. Um, there's a, you know, and there's a variety of, of rules and here the rules are in quotations because um, what you want is you just want them going across the entire field. I've seen them done like this where they're offset. I've seen them done where they're all up and down in columns. Um, as long as it is internally self-consistent, it's usually okay. I've even seen semis done where you have the image, you have the charge, the picture charge in the middle, and then you distribute the, uh, the pieces of the semi around the image. Um, those, don't, those tend to not look as good, but there's nothing heraldically wrong with them. Um, I recently did um, an image for somebody who was fighting in Crown, where they had a unicorn with a semi of, I believe it was stars around it. And I put the stars scattered around, but they weren't they weren't done like they were cloth. I just put them wherever they would fit because that's how she had it on her device. Um, so I think the, the answer to that is, however you do it, be consistent. So you don't wanna have it 
one way in one part of the device and then a different way in, the di in a different part of the device. On uh, note that there is a difference between a semi and, for example, six charges of a particular type, all right? So this right here would represent the semi. Well, this would represent, um, but with the eight round L's, three, two, and three. This would not be a semi, right? This would be a series of round L's on the field. So there is a distinction between the images across the entire field and then individual charges that are being placed on the field as part of the composition. And you want to be able to, to distinguish. You can actually put, for example, if you wanted to, you could do, you've seen the, the example that I had of the ermines, which was across the entire field. You can actually represent the ermine spots individually. And that's perfectly allowed if you wanted to do that. You would have two ermine spots. So that you, we just need to make sure that you have the contrasting colors correct. So that's perfectly allowable too, remembering that one of the, one of the furs is nothing more than an extended semi with a specific, uh, a specific color and um, charge pattern. Hopefully that answered your question. Again, if you've got anything specific, um, if you have general questions on, on heraldic design that you want to answer, specific questions that you want to answer, please feel free to contact me. I haven't I haven't been able to go to events and set up a consulting table in, in three months. I'm kind of itch, itching to, uh, to go out and, uh, and talk to people. So having the opportunity to talk to people about their arms is actually a lot of fun to me. Noticing that I've got lots of real interesting sunburns from, from going out. <laughs> Anything else I can help people with? Hopefully this discussion was useful. Um, this is pretty much the uh, discussion that I normally give when I'm teaching this class at RUM. Um, so when I'm at RUM, I usually have, have a, a blackboard or something that I can write on, which makes it a little bit easier for me to maneuver around somewhat. Normally, once we start getting events going, I do set up heraldic consultation tables. And I promise you, once we start getting events going um, at, at the larger events, at Crown Tournament, at Coronation, I will have a consulting table that will be available at these events. And I bring, I bring resources with me. I bring books with me. I bring coloring. I bring uh, colored pens. I bring uh, dry erase boards. Um, I can usually give you general information. I'm, I'm better at heraldic arm, but I also bring information that's available on naming practices. So I have resources for namings that are also available. Um, if I have more than one of me there and it's not at all uncommon that I don't have two or three or four uh, heralds with me at the table, 
we can usually, between us, we can probably answer most of your Heralda questions pretty well. Um, the consulting tables are specific for, or I'm sorry, are general for names and devices, but we will also answer specific questions like, how do I set up an augmentation? A lot of people have gotten augmentations recently. Um, what are some, uh, one of the common questions I have is that I've talked to a number of local groups about setting up group awards. Uh, and we've talked about that before. Um, one of the more interesting problems that I've come up against, which is uh, uh, hereditary heraldry. How, for example, if you have parents that are in the SCA, how you would inherit their arms. There is a way of doing that within the SCA, but it is generally not applied very much um, because everybody in the SCA is considered to be an individual. Um, they're all encouraged to have separate arms. So hereditary heraldry is something that is, well, quite frankly, becoming more prevalent now because some of the people that started in the SCA 30 or 40 years ago, quite frankly, are starting to children and their grandchildren are trying to acquire their arms and this is a uh, this is becoming a much more prevalent problem within the SCA and these are the kind of questions that we can that I can apply or that I can try to address at consulting tables there are other roles that also can apply too. I, I also talk about things like uh, setting up achievement of arms which is extensive images of uh, that represents your awards and some of the stuff you've done within the SCA those have different roles that apply <laughs> but it's kind of fun when you start looking at it. Anything else I can help people with? Please help me with a question. Let me let me bore you for a minute. <clears throat> one of the things I didn't talk about is Nighthawk's rules of arms. I already talked, mentioned the first one, which is Nighthawk's first rule, which is put the device on a decent sized sheet of paper, put it up on the wall, and then walk away from it and make sure you can identify all of the pieces. And then there is Nighthawk's second rule of arms. And that is, once you have a device that holds together, treat it like you would a tattoo. Put it on your refrigerator and walk by it and look at it a couple of times a day for a month. If after a month you're not sick of it, then you come to Nighthawk's third rule of arms. And Nighthawk's third rule of arms is, have your friends come over and make fun of it. Um, it's amazing what your friends will see that you will not. Um, a few years ago, someone had what looked like a really, really, really cool device. It was a red field with a Thor's hammer in the center with the head of the hammer at the bottom and then two bears basically looking at each other like this are called combatants. So you have the two bears sitting like this across from each other. And I remember I took one look at that and I go, oh, pole dancing bears. And, you know, the last thing you want is to have something on your shield at Penzik and have the Eastern Duke look at his men and go, hey, attack the guy with the pole dancing bears on his shield. On the other hand, if you can live with the, with, the, with the way they make fun of it, then submit it. Hopefully that covers everything that we need here. Um, I don't know how many people are left. I see my wife is still there, but it looks like, uh, it don't look like there are very many other people around. The rules on the achievements, um, they vary by kingdom. Is that correct? Um, achievement, the rules for achievements don't vary that much. The rules for an achievement are essentially, for the most part, similar to the rules of any other charge on the field. You, you can't just start tacking achievements onto your, um, onto your arms. There are some specific rules on how many achievements you can have on a, on, a, on an arms. Um, for example, if you've got three or four achievements, you don't want to put all of them on your arms. You want, kind of, you want to kind of select the ones that you want to put on. And the rules of contrast 
and the rules of complexity are actually still in, in, uh, in they still apply. So um, complexity is something I didn't talk about because normally it's not that huge of an issue. Uh, you have a limit on arms of a complexity of eight. So these are eight different charges or charge groups and or colors. If you get beyond that, your arms are, des are designated as too complex. You start tacking on um, augmentation, not achievements, but augmentations. I meant augmentations. You start tacking on augmentations, um, your complexity can go very large. As far as achievements are concerned, achievements are uh, representations of your heraldic history. And the rules for achievements do tend to vary from kingdom to kingdom. Um, you can usually find them in the sumptuary rules for your kingdom. Um, I know that I've seen them in the new Persuivance Handbook for the Mid-Realm, um, and you can find them there. Um, but there are some subtle differences from kingdom to kingdom. Um, okay. And, and the reality is that there are actually some really interesting rules for achievements that are actually from period that really um, that's look cool at. um so there there are some for example there are different uh representations of helmets that you can get depending on your rank these do not apply to the sca specifically but they do apply they did apply in period um There's what's called a torus, which is essentially they, they wore them on top of the helmet and they were they were kind of like twisted cloth. And the rules for the toruses varied on depending on which country you were. So for example, if you were from England, you had a certain number of loops in it. If you were from France, you would have a different number of loops. Um, in Spain, it, most of them, the, the torus is, is across here. In Spain, they looked at the, the, the uh, they usually looked at the helmet in profile. So the torus actually goes across the back over here. Um, there are some differences in how the crests were set up, uh, which are, which are country specific, um, which are really interesting when you start looking at them. Uh, achievements are fascinating. There isn't a lot of done done with achievements in the SCA. I've only seen a maybe maybe. In all of my time in the SCA, I've maybe seen a dozen achievements, and two or three of those are ones that I help people set up. Um, so they are relatively uncommon within the SCA because, for the most part, they're stuff that you put on top of your of your uh, uh, your wall um, to represent your you know your your time in the SCA. But you can put all of your awards on it. You the the number of what are called supporters is a function of where you of what you've done in the SCA for the most part, which supporters you can actually utilize and what crests you can actually utilize are specific for your achievements within the SCA. Thank you. That's really great information. I really enjoyed your class today. I, it, it, it simplified in many ways a lot of, you know, the terms that I've heard over the year that years that I'm like, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Well, like I said, if you if you got any questions, you can always contact me. Um, heralds are notoriously boring, and I'm I am a typical herald, so I'm really boring, and we like talking about heraldry stuff. So if you don't mind being bored, come on by. I'll happily bore you. I usually have cookies at my table too, so I'll bore you, but I pay you with cookies. Sadly, I'm in Kaid, so I'm fairly far away. I don't I don't get to Out Kingdom events very often. Fair <laughs> Kaid, the land of milk and honey. <laughs> right now it's the land of sun. We have a very good friend of mine who was from Kaid and he has declared Kaid the land of milk and honey. So for in the <laughs> Middle Kingdom, Kaid is always known as the land of milk and honey. You can blame Alexander de Seton. <laughs> well, it's been a very good class. Thank you very much for teaching it today. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Any other questions? I'd be happy to cover any other questions that people have. Other words, I'm other words, I'm pretty much done.
A general consensus is that when it comes to heraldry, people can only stand about, about 60 minutes at a pop. Beyond that, they pretty much start to zone out. It's already an hour and a half. So. Hmm? Well, it's already an hour and a half. Has it been an hour and a half? About 8.30 now. OK. Well, that means I've pretty much reached the limit of my class at this point. Thank you all for stopping by, and thank you all for, for putting up with me. Uh, I really enjoy doing this. It's fun to actually be able to wade back into it again.